I'd like to read with you, please, in John's Gospel and chapter 21. I want to say it's a privilege to be speaking with our brethren, Brother Gene Higgins and our brother Andrew Usher. And also, I would join with them in thanking the conveners of the conference for their invitation to share in the conference at this weekend. We do trust that God will give help in each meeting. John's Gospel, chapter 21. I'd like to read the whole chapter, but it would occupy time, so you'll forgive me if I just select verses as we move through. Verse 1, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and in this wise showed he himself. And then with the list of the disciples, verse 2, verse 3, Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, we also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was come, was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, it is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked or in his underclothes, and did cast himself into the sea. Verse 9, as soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon and bread. Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. And uh, verse 12, Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples dare ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then cometh and taketh bread, and giveth them, and fish also. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he had said it the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whithersoever thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thine hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee, whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. And then we have Peter saying, John, verse 21, Peter saith him, uh, saying him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Verse 25, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written every one. I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. Now we look to the Lord to add his blessing to the public reading of this very precious chapter of our Bible. <clears throat> I'm sure we all enjoy reading the Gospels. Four beautiful presentations of the Savior. It often has been said, it's not original. The first book of your Bible from chapter 12 to the end the book of Genesis, we have four men, Abram, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. One book about four men. The New Testament opens with four books about one. One blessed man that moved in this world to God's glory. Brothers and sisters, let's take time to read the Gospels. It's there that we see the Savior. It's there that we learn of him. And uh, it's, it's so uh, beautiful to even see each one of the Gospels in their setting. 
I would say to those that are young, remember, when you're reading your Bible and come across the number four, it's always num uh, four is divided, three and one. It starts right away back in the book of Genesis and chapter two. There were four rivers that left Eden's garden. I love to notice that one of them, it says there's gold there. I do take it that that's just John's gospel. It's gold. It's where the Savior, the Son of God is presented. And brethren and sisters, how blessed it is to read this lovely gospel. It is unique. The others we call the synoptic uh, gospels. John is very different. Now, I'm not going to go into all of that. I don't have time today to look at. Maybe I should mention, I believe that John's gospel has the blue of the, the, the tabernacle. You know that the four colors that are dominant in the, the, the tabernacle can be linked to the gospels in a beautiful way. You have the linen, the white. That's Luke's gospel. Then you have the purple, and it's the regal color. It's Matthew's gospel. Then you have the scarlet, and that's Mark. But when you come to John's gospel, it is the blue. I really enjoy, you know, brothers and sisters thinking, as that ark moves through the, the wilderness, if you notice the, the order of the coverings in Numbers chapter 3, the blue was the outer coloring for the ark. Brothers and sisters, there was one who moved in this world, and he proved who he was. He was the blessed, eternal son of God. He was from heaven, and that's what we have so often in this wonderful gospel of John. Now, what I want to notice today is, I want to remind our hearts how the gospels finish. Not only do they present the Savior, but the gospels, all four of them, they have a responsibility placed upon the, uh, upon the disciples as the gospels come to, an, uh, come to an end, the last chapter. I'm interested to notice that it's only Mark and Luke that tell us about the ascension of the Lord Jesus. It wasn't that Matthew and, and John didn't know about it, but I want you to notice, and I think it's important to notice, when you're in Matthew's gospel, uh, which brings before us the kingship of the Lord Jesus, we're reminded in chapter 28, all power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Therefore go, make disciples, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Brethren and sisters, that's wonderful. That as we go forth with the gospel, the very one who is the king of kings, what a dignity it brings to service for him. He has promised, lo, I am with you. It's not that he's gone away in, in ascension. He's present with us. Now, John's gospel is different. I have read those that tried to suggest the wonder was chapter 21 added on. It was some of the, some people call it an epilogue of the gospel. And yet I think, and this is what I want to deal with today. There is a final message in John's gospel that maybe we could overlook. It's not really the, the need of souls as we have in the other synoptic gospels. There, it's the need of the world, uh, Matthew 28. Matthew, uh, Mark's gospel, chapter 16. Go you into all the world, preach the gospel. Luke's gospel, chapter 24, that uh, repentance and remission of sins should be preached in all nations. It's the need of the world that's there. But what is John chapter 21 br bringing before us? It's the sufficiency of the Savior on the shore to meet the need of his own. And brother, and that's what I want to deal with this afternoon in this first uh, session of ministry that I'm involved in. The Savior on the shore, his sympathy, his shepherd care, the one that is sovereign, he's the Lord. And the, really, that's, uh, those are the major subjects of this wonderful chapter, John's Gospel, chapter 21. Now, <clears throat> it's normal when you look at John 21 to look at fishing and feasting and the flock and the following. Now, that's not the way that I want to deal with this today. Also, I'm sure there are those that are on the line and you have difficulties in John 21, and I have to confess, I have too. And I'm not going to talk about the problems today that we find. Was Peter correct in, in going fishing at the beginning of the chapter? What is the 153 
uh, fish tell us about. Uh, Lovest thou me more than these? Uh, what are these? Are the fish or are they all the disciples, etc.? I don't want to talk about the problems of the chapter today. I want to speak about the person, the person that's upon the shore. Now, I want you to notice with me in each one of these sections that I'm going to be dealing with in the chapter, and I'm, it's just not not easy verse, but as I just give verses. First of all, I want you to notice that the disciples are feeling the disappointment of barrenness in the first section, barrenness. In the second section, it's they're hungry. Children, have you any meat? In the third section, we're going to look at the need for, yes, uh, to, to feed the flock, but I'm going to deal especially with this word, tend. Tend the, the flock of God. Then in the last section, I, I want to think about the the difficulty of for, uh, uh, for viewing, for viewing or, or looking forward to the future. Because brethren, what has been coming to me is like this. This past year has been a time of testing for God's people. Many of us have felt barren. Many of us have felt hungry. Hungry spiritually, that is. Hungry, not been able to gather together in the normal fashion and be with other believers, be at conferences, have our souls refreshed through ministry of God's word. Yet, brethren and sisters, the reality is we also need the tending. We need the, uh, with all the dangers that's around us, and I'm not even thinking of physical danger. We've been reminded today of, of Satan and all his, his activity to attack God's people. Then in the last section, I would fear there are many of us and we know the reality of our, that their future is insecure. We just wonder why has the Lord allowed so many things to happen in our lives? Brothers and sisters, I want to say today that the one on the shore had the answer to every one of these difficulties that his own were facing. Now, first of all, in the first section, they had gone, they had toiled all night and they had caught nothing. How sad, how difficult that is. How would the one upon the shore meet the need of those that have, have felt the, the limitations of being uh, unfruitful? Our brother has reminded us of uh, John 15, how important it is for to have a life that's fruitful for God. How could the Savior meet the need of such? I want to notice that throughout the chapter, and I think this is so fitting with John's gospel, that we have very simple commands coming from the one that cares upon the shore. You see, we have his care. We have his commands. And I want to see at the end, we have his coming brought before us. Now, first of all, his care. He understood what they were facing. Brothers and sisters, I thank God this, this afternoon to be with you it's this morning. There's one upon the throne and he understands and he cares for his own. They had toiled all night and they had caught nothing. The nets were empty. Now we might ask, why was that? Well, perhaps it was the fact that they had gone of their own devices. Peter has said, I go a fishing. And they really didn't have a divine command to do it. But, you know, I've been looking at other passages and thinking about this. We read in Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, about them washing their nets. We read in Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, about mending the nets. Maybe it's something that we should all think about. If I'm not, if I'm not catching fish out, I'm not seeing the blessing of God as I should. Is there something wrong with me? Or collectively, are, are we, are, are we, is there something that's a barrier to, to the fish being caught? The nets need to be, first of all, clean. The nets need to be mended at times. 
You know, if there's a big hole in the net, we all know very well, the fish will not be caught. May God help us to keep together. Philippians chapter 1 tells us about striving together for the faith of the gospel. What did the Savior do to resolve the problem of barrenness? I, I love this. Just a trilogy of words meets the need in every one of these parts of this chapter. The command from, of the one from the shore was this. Cast the net. Cast the net. Brethren and sisters, instead of us being discouraged, may God help us to understand that there is still fish to be, to be caught. And the command still is, go ye, cast the net. I wonder, and I know very well this past year has been so difficult for activity in the gospel. We've been limited as to being able to meet. We've been able to, unable to move from door to door and, and speak to people and try to encourage them in the gospel to come in and listen to the gospel. Meetings are very difficult. I know all of that. But I hope that we all still have an exercise and that we might hear today the voice from the shore again. Cast the net. There's a big ocean out there of precious souls. You know, I, I fear that some get discouraged. Maybe there's those with us, uh, listening to us today and you've cast the net before and nothing happened. At least you thought nothing happened. You know, brothers and sisters, we shouldn't think that. The preaching of Christ is always precious. There's always results for it. I think of Isaiah 6. We may refer to it on another, another occasion this weekend. Isaiah was to go, and he already was told there was not going to be much fruit. Indeed, they were going to be, uh, it was going to be barren. The people were not going to respond, but he still had to go. May God help us to hear the voice from the shore again today. Cast the net. Barrenness, a guidance, a word from the shore, cast the net. Now look at the second one. And I love this. The saviour that cared for his own. He could have said, have you any fish? He didn't say that. He said, children, and I love that word, have you any meat? Children, have you any food? Brothers and sisters, there was one on the shore. And not only did he understand the barrenness, he understood the feelings within. Here were men that were hungry. Here were men that really were feeling the limitations of the provision that was available to them. Could I apply it? Brethren and sisters, there's one in heaven today. And he understands what all of us have faced this past year. All of the difficulties that have come from is isolation, from all this social distancing and all of that, and unable to gather. Remember, he felt for his own. He could understand what they were going through. And he still is the same today. How would he meet the need of those that were hungry? Another little trilogy, three words. It's not now cast in it. It's come and dine. What words? How simple. Come and dine. They went to, they went to the shore. I, I'm going over, I'm passing over because of time, other things that we could lift from the chapter, the Lordship of Christ. We've heard that. I appreciate it very much. The ministry of our dear brother. They recognized he was the Lord. We could speak about uh, when Peter heard that it was the Lord on the shore. Uh, he he was willing to, to, to dress and to, uh, I believe, swim to the shore. All of that's interesting. What is it? My exercise is to think about the difficulties that we are facing just at the moment and apply it this way. What was it that this, the disciples really needed? There on the shore, the Savior said, come and dine. And they find that there was fish. And there, were, there was bread already available, and it came directly from him. You know, I've really enjoyed this in my own soul, and 
I'd love to get it over to us today in this way. I was thinking that when the last time that there was uh, uh, in Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, that uh, Peter, you remember, he, he was in the boat. The boat had been used by the Lord Jesus to speak to the people on the shore. You remember the Lord Jesus said to cast out the nets, plural, and Peter had said, I'll cast out the net, singular. And you remember the multitude of fishes and the, the boat was almost, uh, uh, it was going, going under the water because of all the, the fish that was there. If you notice what happened there, the Lord Jesus was with them. That's just descriptive of all the three and a half years that the Savior would be with them here as they would work as, uh, as fishers of men. Here the Lord Jesus is upon the shore and he's telling his own, even though he's not physically with them, there's still work to be done. But what's he doing on the shore? He's meeting their need. He's caring for them. What must it have been for the disciples as they approached the shore to discover that there was food available, that the Savior had sufficient for them, that there was something that was going to come from his hand that was going to satisfy them, that they were going to eat. Brothers and sisters, I want to speak to us all today. In this past year, we have been alone often. I wonder how many of us really knew what it was daily to get something from his hand. To get food that he had prepared for you. There's a parallel passage that I've been really enjoying thinking about this. It's found in Ruth, the little book of Ruth, chapter 2. Remember that story, beautiful story of Ruth. She was in the field in chapter 2. She had uh, been going behind the reapers. But at, at uh, dinner time or at lunch time, in the middle of the day, she came into contact with him. And he reached to her a broiled fish. And she ate, and it says, she was sufficed and left. That is, she left it over. I'm interested to notice as you move down that chapter, whenever it comes to the stage of the end of the day, she winnowed the, uh, the, uh, what she had gleaned herself. And she went home with that which she had prepared. But did you ever notice when she met her mother-in-law, Naomi, that she gave not what she, had, she herself had, had uh, been able to gather that day. She gave what had left, been left over from what had sufficed her. She gave to her mother-in-law what she had got from his hand. Brothers and sisters, how wonderful it is. And you and I hear the words come and dine. When we can get something from his hand that really satisfies. Something of himself. Something that warms our heart. Something that will be to the very spiritual sustenance of the believer. We all need this. And it's available to us individually. Could I encourage us all today, not just only to cast the net, but come and dine. Have time spent with him, alone with him. May God help us. I need to move on. In the third section, I'm interested to notice this. The Lord Jesus waited until Peter had dined. When he had really received the, and eaten the food that he had, uh, the Lord had given him, it was then that he said to, to, uh, to Peter, these words that we have, lovest thou me. Now, once again, there's so much in these verses, the different words for love and the different words to know and the different words for sheep, the different uh, words that feed and tend word. I'm not going to go into that today. It's not important. What I want to notice is this. The one that had been satisfied with the food of the Savior is now the one that's been asked to feed the flock. Can I speak to shepherds today? 
And I know there are many that are on, and I'm not a critical a critic of those that are shepherds in God's assembly. God bless you, everyone. That's what I say to you. And we do try to care for God's people ourselves and our field of labor. Brothers and sisters, if we are going to feed God's, feed the flock, we need to know ourselves of what it is to be feeding and what we get from him. I'm interested to notice the three times. I do think that there's a reflection on the number three. The Lord Jesus is reminding Peter, remember, you that denied me thrice. thrice. Is this someone that, someone that had denied the Lord? Could such a one really feed the flock? Remember the words of the Lord Jesus in Luke chapter uh, 20, 22, isn't it? Satan hath desired to have thee, that he might sift thee as wheat. But do you remember the words? When thou art converted, when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. That is, brethren and sisters, it's the one that has understood their own weakness and has experimented their own failure. It's going to be those that are going to both be able to feed and to tend the flock of God. They're going to understand the danger. But more. Uh, I love to think of recovery. I know we don't have all the information here in John 21. First Corinthians 15 reminds us that Peter had had an individual meeting with the Lord Jesus. There had been restoration. And we need that. Am I speaking to someone today? And you've got away, you've got cold. Perhaps there's something has happened in your life. I'm not talking about something moral or something that's going to leave a mark and limit your usefulness. Brothers and sisters, very often we can get cold. We can go through experiences that really are going to mark and limit our testimony. But brothers and sisters, there is restoration. Thank God for that. And here's a restored man. And now there's a message that's going to come from the, shore, from the one on the shore. Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. Tend my sheep. 2021. Can I remind especially those that are leaders in God's assembly of the solemn responsibility that it is. Our brother Andrew has been reminding us it's very easy just to think of ourselves, just to think of me and mine and ours, especially those that are leaders in God's assembly, should have a burden and a care for those that have gone through difficulties and are going through it. I know you may not be able to visit in the home. Mind you, a shepherd should be visiting. But even a phone call, a text, I have so many ways of being able to be in touch one with another. The flock needs cared for. Oh, can I remind us all today of the solemnity of this. There are enemies out there. Everyone knows the figure of a sheep is very different to the figure of fish. A sheep is, some, is an animal that really needs to be tended, to be fed, to be cared for. I have a brother-in-law that for many years was a shepherd. Sheep very, very easily can become uh, diseased in their feet. Many a believer gets diseased in their walk. You know that it's not only disease, but it's danger. It's very easy for a, in a flock, for a dog or some animal to attack. Well, I can tell you, brethren and sisters, this figure should go home to all our hearts today. There are dangers. We've been reminded of the, the evil one. And the host of, of evil that's against us. And the necessity to care for one another. And especially those that are in responsibility in the assembly. Feed the flock of God. Feed. Could I just mention this before passing on? It was love to him that was, should be the motivating factor. There are these three times the Savior reminds Peter, remember. Lovest thou me? It's out of love to me that you need to care for these. I'm interested to notice in Acts chapter 20, verse 28. 
The same figure is used of a flock by Paul to, when he was speaking to the elders of the assembly at Ephesus. There he said, feed the flock of God which are among you. But they tell you said more that he has purchased with his own blood. I hope that we see that flock. Not only do we, do we love them, do we express the love of Christ to them, but remember the price that was paid that they could be redeemed. Then I think of 1 Peter chapter 5. You remember Peter himself what he said, I who am an elder and a witness of the, uh, the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Brethren and sisters, it's not only to remember the price that was paid for, for the flock, but the future that's going to be theirs. Very soon, we're all going to be gathered home. We're going to be dealing with that in a moment or two. May God help us to understand that little while is here. We have a, an, a, a responsibility to feed, to tend the flock of God. Cast the net. Come and dine. Uh, feed my sheep, my lambs. And I want to move into this last section. And I've really been enjoying this last section as well. And I trust that uh, I may be able especially to deal with this matter of the future. This Gospel of John is closing in a way that should really be an encouragement to us all. Peter has been reminded that there's going to be a future that's going to be difficult. There's going to be a pathway that's before him. I know he's been told, remember the late Mr. Jack Hunter uh, reminding us, he's been told here that when thou art old, there's going to be difficulties. Maybe that was, Mr. Hunter told us, that was the reason why he had such confidence as he suffered in the Acts of the Apostles. He was able to sleep in the, in the, in the prison because he knew he still wasn't old. The end was not yet. And we don't know that, brethren. We don't know what another year is going, to, is going to bring. I'm going to be speaking tomorrow morning in the report, and we're going to have to refer to some that were young, but because of COVID, they already are in heaven. Sadly, believers are not exempt from trial. We don't know what our future holds. Brethren and sisters, thank God there's one on the shore. And there's a message that he has for you and I. Follow thy me. Discipleship, I know, is the, is the idea of it. But if it's interesting, the very di disciples here that were to make disciples in others, they're reminded of the real responsibility. Follow thy me. I was thinking that this responsibility of following. First of all, it's individual. And the key, the secret we have here is this. If I'm going to follow my Savior individually, I must know relationship with him. There must be intimacy. There must be a controlling factor that is something that's real in your life and mine. How many of us really know that, brethren and sisters? Every day, you know, I think of the Savior himself. There was, I love that passage in Isaiah chapter 50. That morning by morning, his ear was wakened to hear as the learned one. Unbroken fellowship. You see, if I'm going to follow, I need to have that, something like that in my life. An intimacy with him. Something that's individual. You see, Peter was told what was going to happen to him, and he wanted to know what John was going to uh, was going to happen to John, and he really was told, "That's not your business. Follow thy me. Here's something that's a personal relationship between the believer and the Lord." Second thing that I want you to think about: it's a personal responsibility between the individual and the Lord. His control of me is such that I have to obey. Brothers and sisters, Peter is reminded that this responsibility of following the Lord was 
even going to bring them into difficulty. There's something in our mind that we sort of think, if I'm in obeying this command to follow, my life is going to be easy. My life is going to be guaranteed that there's going to be no problems. Brethren, it's not like that at all. That concept is absolutely foreign for the scripture. And I tell you that some of us have come into the re realization of this. It's following him that can bring us into great difficulties. And sometimes the very plans that we make for our life, we really have to buy and acknowledge. My plans were wrong. I have to accept that it's, it's his will. If I will, he tarry till I come. I have to buy to it. And I have just to follow him. It's my relationship. It's my responsibility. I love to think of this. It's not only individual relationship. It's not only individual responsibility. It's an individual reassurance. If I will, that he tarry till I come. What is that to thee? But when the Lord has shown Peter that he is going to have to pass through problems, it's going to have that hand that it's not going to be easy. What does John tell us? It's going to be for God's glory. By what death he should glorify God. See, brothers and sisters, what is our life all about? What is really the purpose why God has saved you and I? It's to glorify God. It's to have something in your life and mine that will glorify the one who, who gave his son for us. Is that not the purpose that we all should have? A life that's useful. A life that, no matter what the cost is going to be, is going to be glorifying to God. Brothers and sisters, that is exactly what you and I should be aiming for. That should, should be your, our responsibility. And that should be our desire daily in your life and mine. There's a pathway it's going to be painful, but there's a priority. It's his will. But there's one thing I really enjoyed. It's passing. You see, <clears throat> they've had his care. They've had his commands. But there's one thing here at the end of this, and it's, you only get it in John's gospel. You know that it's only in John's gospel that the rapture is brought before us. Twice over here in these last verses of the chapter. We have these wonderful words, till I come. We're going to be dealing with it in the Bible reading in a moment or two. The rapture is something that's real. No matter how difficult the pathway is, it's either being, going to be glorifying to God and service for him, even if there's a price to pay and laying down our lights, or it's going to be the moment the Lord Jesus even suggests that John could have enjoyed. If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Brothers and sisters, I do believe his coming is at the very door. You know, if, it, if we've been dealing with personal, relation, individual responsibility, individual relationship, individual uh, reassurance, there's going to be an individual reward. Peter will receive it. John will receive it. You and I are going to have to give an account of your life and mine for, for God. I trust that you and I will know what it is. To have been obedient to the one on the shore. To obedient, be obedient to his commands. Cast the net. Come and dine. Feed my flock. Lastly, follow thy me. I'm just going to close now. I love to notice just this last point. The gospel that commenced with the Logos, the word, the word being made flesh. I love to notice how it closes. It's not just a word. The last verse of this chapter reminds us of books that could be written, that the world itself could not contain. Brothers and sisters, how wonderful a saviour you and I have. How wonderful it is to know that he still cares for us. 
and that soon he's coming for us. But we're going to ask for the Lord's blessing. And I trust that this little word will be an encouragement to us all as we look out on all the difficulties that you and I are facing with this pandemic and all the problems. Thank God there's one on the shore and he understands. May God bless his word to us all. Let us pray. Our Father, we bow with thanksgiving to thee for thy word today. We've been reminded that we are in Christ. We bless thee for this. We thank thee that soon we're going to be with him. But we thank thee that soon we're going to see his face. We thank thee for his lordship. We look to thee that thou wouldst help us to understand our responsibility of being obedient to him. We thank thee for these essentials of life that we've been reminded, spiritual things that are needed, faith and self-denial and love and fruitfulness of abiding in Christ. Father, we thank thee for reminding us of the one on the shore, that there's one still that cares for his own. There's one still that has commands for us that will control our life here. And Father, we bless thee most of all. There's one that as soon is coming for us. We thank thee for the privilege of being able to share thy word with thy people. We pray that as the conference proceeds, we think of the Bible being look at soon and remember our brother and leader in ministry and remember our brother in the gospel. We just pray thy blessing and that the rich sense of thy presence uh, that we have already enjoyed might continue with us. We thank thee for every mercy and we pray for thy blessing upon us now in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.